One of the interesting themes that has that pops up in the book, and it seems to be the premise of the entire book, is that the things we reach for to stop feeling bad, like porn, drugs, entertainment, binging, etc., might actually be the thing that's causing us to feel bad. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's the core message, right? Super non-intuitive, um, but we're always looking for causality and we're trying to understand it. And it turns out that we're really good at noticing immediate causal effects, but really bad at noticing delayed causative effects. And so in the short term, these kinds of uh, highly rewarding escapist types of reinforcing substances and behaviors work great, uh, which is why we reach for them again and again. But iteratively over time, they actually change our brains such that uh, we need more and more to get the same effect. Uh, they don't work as well as they used to. They can even turn on us and do the opposite, make us more anxious, more depressed, less able to sleep. Um, and then eventually they can actually contribute to um, pathological mind states like chronic depression, anxiety, insomnia, chronic irritability, and ultimately anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure in anything that we do. That's a word that came up in some of the interviews that you've done that I was watching that, I, that I'd never heard before, the inability to experience pleasure from anything you do. And is that a result of the incessant pursuit of pleasure by any means? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a psychiatric term, or at least it's typically has been used historically, mostly in the field of psychiatry. Um, hedonic or hedonia means joy, and anhedonia means the absence of joy. And it's something that we have observed for decades in people with severe major depressive disorder, uh, that they can get to a point where uh, they just lose the capacity to feel pleasure in anything that they do, including things that used to give them pleasure. But a severe uh, chronic depression uh, is almost identical to the kinds of uh, pres clinical presentation we see in people who are uh, severely addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, video games, uh, shopping, you know, gambling, whatever it is. Uh, they come in looking very, very anhedonic. Uh, they will report that they struggle with depression and that they're essentially self-medicating with their addictive behavior, that the addictive behavior is the only thing that works for them. And then very often, because they see their addictive behavior as medicinal and not primary, they want me, the psychiatrist, to fix their depression, which they believe would then allow them to stop engaging in the addictive behaviors. But there are a couple important fallacies with that. The first is that in the vast majority of cases, when we use our various uh, antidepressant treatments, whether it's medication or it's psychotherapy, uh, in the context of addictive use, they don't work, okay? So that mm -hmm. people don't tend to respond uh, to those interventions. Every once in a while, you'll get a responder. But in general, um, what we have to offer is a drop in the ocean uh, of their uh, uh, pursuit of these highly uh, reinforcing substances and behaviors. But the Sorry, other... Yeah, I had to click that button, so I lost the last point of what you said. You said the things that you guys give don't work, are like prescription pills or what? Yeah, so basically antidepressants, anxiolytics, um, psychotherapy, these are all evidence-based treatments for depression. And in mm. general, when someone is in their addiction and we try, we deliver those treatments, the treatments don't don't work. Yeah, And again, yeah. it's because they're, they're overwhelmed and overpowered by the uh, by the physiologic impact of the addictive behavior. And mm. that's the other kind of fallacy of this whole self-medication hypothesis, which is to say that what feels like is medicinal for the psychiatric symptom or the emotional distress is really causative. But yeah. because we are not good at observing long-term impact, we just are good at observing you know, momentary impact, um, we often don't realize it until we take a break from yeah. that substance or behavior and get enough distance to be able to look back and say, oh my gosh, I don't recognize that person who was so invested in that behavior. And I feel so much better now. 
than I did when I was using. And so these are the, the types of, of, of things that we see often in clinical care. I've even, uh, in the past two years with venturing into healing from sex addiction, porn addiction, and as I can continue to make my way out of those woods into greener pastures, I, there are like still waves of, of like realizations where I go, how the hell did I, why did I even think that way? How did yes. I get so messed up? And yes. like exactly what you're saying, it's hard. You can't even consider, I think something you said in an interview that I was watching earlier was like, you can't tell what's going on in the box while you're still in the box right. and you have to get out of it. And, um, it's so interesting. Something that it, it seems to be, and please share me, share your thoughts with me on this. It seems to be like it, it boils down so much to just our inability to, I, I forgot the word exactly that you said, but like be able to see past the very current moment of what would make right. my pain go away right. instead of seeing that what I'm, what I'm using is causing. It seems to be like uh, the, the, like the image in my head that helps me a lot with my own cravings is the one marshmallow, two marshmallow, like experiment where they give the kids an opportunity to wait and it's better later, you know, but it seems to be the, yeah. like, the heart component of it. Yeah. I think one, one way to kind of think about it is to think about, um, reflexes or things that our brains are wired to do automatically versus, um, behaviors and actions and inferences that we make using our higher cortical systems. And we are reflexively evolved over millions of years to approach pleasure and avoid pain, right? We, we don't have to think about that. We just, babies do that, you know, adult, it's just like, I'm in pain. How can I get out of it? Like that, that's just so hard now. right <laughs> <Instantly>. now, right <laughs> now, right. <laughs> And the truth of the matter is that that deeply um, ingrained, very phylogenetically conserved uh, mechanism in our brain is what has kept us alive over millions of years of evolution in a world uh, you know, of scarcity and danger. But it's a terrible mechanism for the world we live in now where we are constantly being titillated, invited to consume, seduced to do more of whatever it is that makes us feel good. And so therefore we can't actually rely on our instincts in some very fundamental way. We can't listen to our brains. We have to and, learn how to turn off those sort of automatic responses. And for the listener, can you kind of walk us through why that's not the best software now in the world of abundance we live in? Sure. So I, I use this extended metaphor of a, of a balance. Think about a teeter-totter or a seesaw in a kid's playground that represents how we process pleasure and pain. One of the major discoveries in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that pleasure and pain are actually co-located in the brain. So the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain. And on a very simple, fundamental level, they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when we do something pleasurable, we, we tilt to the side of pleasure, we experience pain, we, we tilt to the side of pain. Now there are certain rules governing this balance. And the first and most important rule is that the balance wants to remain level such that our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance with any deviation from neutrality. And the way that our brains restore a level balance is first by tilting an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus is. So if we do something pleasurable that releases reward neurotransmitters in the reward pathway, the balance tilts to the side of pleasure, but then our brain adapts by tilting that balance to the side of pain temporarily before going back to the level position. I like to imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring us level again, but they like it there. So they don't get off as soon as we're level. They stay on until we're tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the hangover, the after effect, the craving, right? Um, but if we wait long enough without using again, they hop off and homeostasis is restored. If we don't wait, they uh -huh. start to accu accumulate on the pain side of the balance and then effectively they're camped out there and we've changed our hedonic set point and now we're into addicted brain. Where this started to click for me was I thought initially when reading the book that the balance goes to the side of pleasure and then 
the um, you know the pain response pushes back down to get us equal. And I didn't, I didn't, it didn't really click for me until maybe the second or third time visiting the concept that what you were saying was it actually tilts to the opposite side, right? So is that correct? Yes. And that, you know, when we experience that in a very obvious way, it's like a hangover, right? You know, you, you, you have a binge drinking episode and you have a hangover, but there are many gradations of experiencing that even outside of conscious awareness, just that like intense urge to watch another video, even though I told myself that that would be the last video, right? And that's a kind of a pain um, that we get when that homeostatic mechanism has been tilted to the side of pain and an overwhelming physiologic drive to want to restore the balance. And the fastest way to do that, rather than just waiting for the gremlins to hop off, is to watch another video to get us back. To that level, but but all that does is accumulate more and more gremlins on the pain side of the balance, and ultimately we can again change that hedonic set point so that once we're in addicted brain, we're now walking around with a balance chronically tilted to the side of pain. We're in a chronic dopamine deficit state. Now we need to use our drug in ever more potent forms, not to get high and feel good or solve the original problem, but just to level the balance and feel normal or back to baseline. Mm. That is the, I'm so grateful for your work, Anna, and for your book, because it's yeah. that kind of insight that allowed me and so many other people, I, I think I could speak for, who have benefited from your work and to the stuff that you present in the book, Dopamine Nation, because the inability for us to, to kind of pay attention to the future and for us to always act in the interest of pursue pleasure, avoid pain, seems like an inescapable prison. You could become a Buddhist monk and meditate the rest of your life and mm-hmm. try to free yourself from it. But the um, the the insight that pain is coming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, it's coming, and you can, you know, there's some one one thing that I wrote down that I heard you say uh, in an interview was uh, every every pleasure has a cost or something to that fact. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just, that is, that really helps me to gain some distance when I'm making decisions like pleasure or pain. And it's like, well, obviously Mm -hmm. you choose pleasure, but if you really think, well, this is going to cause me to feel worse in the future. And then even in the near future, the next 30 minutes or so, if I indulge in a habit, then, okay, then I'm kind of choosing the pain, (laughs) you know, is it worth it? Is it worth that? Right. Yeah. And, you know, extrapolating from that, the kind of big idea in Dopamine Nation is that maybe one of the reasons we have a mental health crisis today and maybe one of the reasons that so many modern people seem to be so unhappy despite having so much is because we're constantly pursuing pleasure and effectively changing our hedonic or joy set point to the side of pain which is not something that we are evolved for. We're, we're really wired for pain. We're, we're meant for things to be <laughs> physically and mentally hard. And in the absence of that hardship, our brains like get really, really confused. We are confused. <laughs> yeah, I know we're I am. To, oh man, <laughs> we're trying to figure this thing out. I mean, like just the way it makes sense in my mind is just going, if you feel bad, wait it out. You know? Or even more paradoxically, if you feel bad, do something that's more painful than the pain you're experiencing in the moment, which is completely countercultural, right? And again, I'm yeah. not talking here about, about cutting or, or things that are actually <laughs> harmful. But if you think about that pleasure pain balance, you know, we know that when we press on the pleasure side, those neuroadaptation gremlins hop on the pain side, but it turns out the opposite is also true. And when we yeah. press on the pain side, for example, with exercise, intermittent fasting, ice cold water baths, even things that are effortful, but maybe not physically painful, those gremlins will go over and hop on the pleasure side and we will get our dopamine indirectly by paying for it up front, which is a much better way to get dopamine. And is it a better, like a longer tail, like a little bit of like you, you go like, okay, I should go drink or go watch porn or go do my drug of choice. I'm going to have a little bit of pleasure followed by a long tail of of down regulation is that kind of the, the way it looks a spike and then a, like this kind of long holdout 
Great. So if you imagine that we're always releasing dopamine at a kind of baseline tonic level, which, which we mm -hmm. are, what happens when we expose ourselves to intoxicants, highly reinforcing pleasurable substances or behaviors, we get a sudden spike in dopamine firing in the reward pathway, followed by dopamine free fall, not just to baseline, but actually below baseline. Mm -hmm. So then we're in that dopamine deficit state, that state of craving slash withdrawal, conscious or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, ultimately that's what allows the, the mechanism to kind of then correct back up to the baseline. That's what I mean by for every pleasure, we pay a price. Yeah. Conversely, when we do something that's painful up front, we don't get that dopamine spike. What instead happens is that our body registers injury. And in response mm -hmm. to injury, because even, even exercise is immediately toxic to cells. <laughs> <laughs> right. So our body then senses injury, starts to upregulate feel good neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, endogenous opioids, endogenous cannabinoids. And we get a gradual increase of dopamine firing. So not a spike, a gradual increase over the latter half of the exercise. And then those dopamine levels remain elevated for hours after we stop yeah. exercising. Yeah. Before yeah. Before going back down to the level position without ever going into that dopamine deficit state. And that dopamine deficit state is the state of craving, which is why most of us kind of don't crave exercise. Like we have to remind ourselves every day, I got to do this again to feel good. Most yeah. of us anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying it's not. So I, like one question I want to ask is, is it one to one? Is it like you get a one unit of spike for one unit of like down or is it you actually if you go up high for a, an ex whatever habit you have then you get longer like a longer tail of having to pay for it and then when if, if you did the thing that was hard so you dipped into kind of the pain intentionally you get a longer tail like is the reward is longer and the pain is longer you know what i'm saying yeah you know i don't think we really have the data at that level of detail we really have it more broadly and conceptually um mm. that you know uh, that if you think again about this pleasure pain balance and how it evolved over over millions of years of evolution really it evolved for a world in which uh, rewards would be very difficult to find scarce so not much of them and we would have to do a lot of upfront work in order to get those so it evolved for that balance tipping into hunger cold yeah. loneliness right F physical discomfort and then us doing work finding the re you know the natural reward and then bringing it back up homeostatically or even a little bit tipped to the side of pleasure. But instead what we're doing is we're slamming down to the side of pleasure repeatedly with these high high reinforcers that you know cause this huge release of dopamine that our brains were not evolved for, which naturally our brains are like, whoa, fire hose, right? And then have to compensate by flipping down the other way. And that's what leads then to these binge cycles or the the kind of vortex of addiction where this compulsive continued use despite our wanting to stop. Do you see that in your, because you work with a lot of students in your practice. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that in a lot of students, like a lot of young people where they're just constantly stimulating, constantly indulging, constantly trying to claw their way out of the, the dopamine deficit that they're incurring through their actions to their own demise? Well, I mean, I yeah, I mean, so what what we see a lot of we see that in in all of our patients, students or not, you know, not students, adults, young adults, older people. Um, I think you know what, what is very characteristic of students here at Stanford and in Silicon Valley, people in Silicon Valley more broadly, is a kind of a work hard, play hard thing, where people mm -hmm. are sort of slamming down on, let's say, the pain side of the balance, you know, overextending themselves work wise, and then instead of letting that be its own natural correction, they're then slamming down on the pleasure side with intoxicants at the end of the day, whether it's alcohol or cannabis or you know, shows or pornography. So you get this kind of the seesaws going like, boop, 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 boop. And that, yeah. that, that's, you know, the, the definition of stress, of biological stress is any deviation from neutrality. So Ooh. this kind of manipulation or attempt to control what we're experiencing, either by pressing on pleasure or pain, is what we see a lot of and, it, you know, is essentially what contributes to stress, but also to this kind of a physiologic uh, you know, vortex of, of this compulsive control problem. Plus mm -hmm. again, the things that we've talked about, the changing the hedonic set point and such. How prevalent is 
pornography addiction, sex addiction, and the patients you worked with and have you seen it change over the years? Well, there was very clear signal in the early 2000s after the advent of the internet, and then especially around 2007, 8, 9, 10, uh, with the advent of the smartphone and the kind of portable internet access, huge uh, increase in the numbers of people coming in, mostly middle-aged men um, looking for help with sex, pornography, compulsive masturbation, um, you know, using the internet essentially uh, to feed this habit. Um, and, and they almost universally endorsed the internet and smartphones and that sort of <laughs> access being where, you know, the deciding factor where they went from occasional engagement in those behaviors to a kind of life destroying, um, compulsive use of those behaviors. So that was, that was a powerful shift in the first decade of uh, the century. Mm. I, I've always, in my experience with pornography, I've thought like, man, if it was that bad, it wouldn't be legal. And that's kind of like something that I've learned as I've matured and, and moved away from that, that way of living is like, man, there's plenty of things that aren't illegal that'll, that'll ruin your life. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Alcohol, tobacco, and lots of social media. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the sex addiction stuff I think is particularly interesting because in my mind, it's an example of stripping a complex, like you think about sex with somebody, a complex, rich, meaning, nourishing, potentially experience yeah. down to just the ability to feel pleasure and orgasm. You know, there's a, a podcast that I had recently with a guy named Alexei Walsh, who is a London based holistic sex teacher for the last two decades. And he describes and I wanted to, I want to hear your thoughts on this, what your reaction is mm -hmm. to this. He, he describes a um, uh, kind of a different way of viewing sex as in, in, in terms of us, or he uses the phrase a saturation model that in, sex is a field of which, or an experience that you have with somebody that is rich with emotional substances of love and devotion and play and uh, connection and pleasure is a is kind of this golden thread that weaves in throughout it, um, but it's it is only one of the many beautiful experiences that are to be had during that 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 um, during a moment of sex with somebody. And um, I thought it was really interesting in comparison to the way that maybe most people see sex, at least in America, which is more better, more of a thrill, more pleasure, more orgasm, and it's just solely focused on pleasure. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, as a woman in her fifties, it's it's really stunning to see that cultural shift um, over the past twenty five years. You know, going from thinking of sex as something sacred and something uh, that is part of cultivating intimacy uh, and a meaningful relationship to being something sort of the equ equivalent of exercise. Um, mm -hmm you know, plus a jolt of dopamine in the form of orgasm. And, you know, for many people, orgasm is intensely uh, pleasurable. Um, so it's not easy. It's not, it's not hard to see how for those, for those for whom orgasm is, um, you know, uniquely pleasurable um, above other kinds of intoxicants, how living in a world where sex partners and pornography and, you know, paths to orgasm, have become so um, accessible and potent and culturally sanctioned and condoned, separate and independent from uh, the cultivation of deep intimacy, um, plus just frankly the commercialization of almost everything that we do now. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not really surprised to see the shift, but I can tell you, I'm I'm saddened by it, and and you know, it's just I mean to be totally honest, Braxton, I, I, just even the fact that 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 information is a bit of a revelation for you, it is like kind of both stunning and sad to me. I mean, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. No, but no. you're absolutely it, right. <laughs> it's you're just absolutely. like, yeah, it's like, wow, what, you know, what happened? You know, what, where, yeah. where did, where did we decouple those, those two things? Um, and, you know, it's, it's not like, it's, it's not like this, I mean, 
so interest in pornography and, and interest in sex. I mean, that's always been with us and, and, and people who have a heightened interest in it, a heightened pursuit, but, but something has really shifted in the culture um, that, that is just sort of like sex for its own sake. Um, yeah. now, I don't want to cast judgment on, you know, this is not judgment on people's lifestyle choices or, or whatever. I don't know what the future holds, but it is, yeah, just sex as a way to get a particular feeling for myself. Just, it just seems inherently, um, let's see. Empty. On, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is, <laughs> it is, which is what led me out, which made me go, okay, this is, this doesn't seem to ever end. I don't right. think I'm ever going to get this elusive, grandiose reward that I feel like I'm chasing down. Yeah. And on top of that, my relationships romantically are suffering and sex in real life because of pornography usage, because of the abuse of pornography is, is just seems less interesting and boring comparatively. Right. Yeah. And that right there is a key feature of compulsive overconsumption of intoxicants, not just to sex, but to all rewarding things that we have a narrowing of our focus and other things become less salient. We have, we have no joy in them. And without this particular medium, whatever our medium is, alcohol, cannabis, sex, we can't, we can't get pleasure from it. So, I mean, and that's of course the grief reaction, right? I mean, not to assume your journey, but your, you know, the, the recovery then is about, well, how can I find joy in this activity, you know, without it being as pleasurable as that other thing that I was doing. Um, and then yeah. there's going to be, you know, a grief reaction to that. Like, wow, it's a, like, I have to completely reorient on what is the purpose of sex in my life? I have that on a sticky note on my desk at work. I says, what's the purpose of this? And it says like love, connection, play, pleasure. It's something that Alex Say um, suggested. And it has felt, I mean, right. you know, I'll be totally transparent. My sex life now, it feels like this unfamiliar territory where I'm going like, I'm successfully no longer focused on objectifying my partner for dopamine hits and personal pleasure. And That's it leaves great. me going like, well, what do we do here? <laughs> right, like, why are uh, we doing this again? Right. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. so, it's, it's so different. Yeah. And I, and look, I, I totally, um, obviously it's, it's not the greatest thing to hear, but I, I, I completely accept your comment of like, it's sad to see how far off I got with the sex stuff. And collectively, I think as I think a lot of people, yeah, have gotten yeah. off. Oh, oh yeah. Gotten yeah. Off. <laughs> a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of people got off track with the sex stuff. Right, um, right. I will say that, f that, uh, and this is probably the most, the biggest part of my in, a curiosity of chatting with you today is it kind of leads me into a, a, f a, like a lens of looking at the world through a lens of like, um, seeking out things that aren't necessarily, like you just said, necessarily pleasurable, mm -hmm. but maybe rich in other things that are, that are deeply nourishing, you know, right. could you speak on that for people that are like me that are kind of making their way out of the woods and go, okay, I'm not being led so much by pleasure. Now, what is the emotional substances and sensations I can start to attune my life to that might be more fulfilling and more meaningful? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, as part of this reflexive wanting to approach pleasure and avoid pain, one thing that we do, most of us, for most of our lives unconsciously is that we really run from our pain. And yet, you know, my experience and that of, of many others is that it's not until we stop running and turn and face that thing that we're running from that we first begin to feel a sense of peace and serenity and the ability to you know, be comfortable in ourselves and in our lives. So it's extremely counterintuitive, but it really does begin with openly acknowledging the negative emotions, thoughts, cognitions, experiences that we're having in the moment. And it's so fascinating to me, even now, after years of doing this work, when we open the door to awareness of those negative emotions, we can completely reorient on them and 
on our experience in the, in the moment in a way that just feels incredibly, again, peaceful, nourishing, protected. It's, it's the most interesting thing, you know, that happens. What um, is? J just when we stop running from our uncomfortable emotions. I mean, I'll give you a very small example. Um, I mean, this is sort of a ridiculous example, but anyway, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, like, so, so one of the thing, things that I do when I'm feeling like a, a little bit of shame about just who I am and what I have to offer the world is I will kind of get louder and sort of more grandstandy and try to be more charismatic and, and funnier. Um, and even as I'm doing that, I'm realizing that like it's a little off putting for people, which then accelerates the shame, which then accelerates my tendency to engage in those behaviors. And then I'll come away from that encounter and I'll feel a mixture of self-loathing and also resentment toward these my, you know, designated audience for not being sufficiently wowed by my charisma. So you, it's already majorly convoluted. You can see there, right? I mean, yeah. a lot, a lot of, a lot of narcissistic kinds of features. But if I am able in the moment to be like, oh, you know, I'm actually a little nervous around this group of people. I don't know that well. And I'm wondering how I'm going to be perceived. And I'm feeling shame, actually. I'm feeling shame that is anticipating that they won't like me or that I won't be, that they'll talk badly about me after this encounter. The moment I see that, I stop all those compensatory, weird compensatory behaviors that make it worse. And I just go, you know what? You know, God, life is hard. And here I am. I'm like kind of in a shame, self-loathing spiral. It's it's going to be okay. And then, you know, again, this happens so often. Then all of a sudden, because I've let down that weird defense thing that I do when I feel shame, like people they respond better, you know, to me. And I can yeah, then feel, person. yeah, I'm like a real person. I'm not trying to like use them and control their, you know, perceptions, which by the way, we can't do anyway, but we, we always try or we often try. And then I kind of settle into, yeah, you know, I'm whatever I am. It is what it is. And then like the, the, it changes, right? The feeling changes. And so that's just one example, but it's so hard to do. Yeah, it's so the, hard to do alchemizing that feeling into something that's different it, it's it is so challenging to do but it's what what it's what is there for you i had a dream recently that um showed me a very clear uh, sensation of the alchemizing of fear into bliss when you lean right. into surrender yeah and but those moments aren't available to us if we don't you know because you might go damn i'm feeling shame feel it you turn to it you see it and then it kind of right. it just shifts by labeling it it's like okay I'm feeling some shame right now and that's causing me to want to do that whole thing, but I'm, I'm not right. going to do the, the compensatory behavior. So I'm just going to be here with it and it changes subtly. And then you kind of start to feel potentially a sense of like humanity, shared humanity, you know, to other people. Ab absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah, all, it's so weird. I mean, al alchemizing it is, is a great, is a great term because it's like, it, it is so fascinating how, we pick up on these things and in, in other people, like when they're at, you know, we don't quite know what it is, but it's sort of like this person's kind of being weird. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we sort of feel like oh, what's going on there. And then but that triggers us. And it's such a weird spiral, but um, you can really change it by changing your own um, sort of orientation inside yourself. You can, you can really change the, the room. Yeah, it is. It, this is beautiful. This is exactly how I was hoping that we would be able to kind of steer this conversation into a direction that sheds light on a lifestyle that is less reactive to use the word that you right. used earlier from, for those painful emotions and maybe feels like more of a response, more of a tenderness, more of yeah. allowing yourself to feel this, to feel whatever's coming up in you. That is like, yeah. you know, what is it that drives to especially to the person listening like what is it that drives your behavior what is it the thing that makes you reach for whether it's compulsive use of sex or pornography or video games or you know what is it and maybe just for a fun experiment have you ever tried feeling that thing with more texture with more sensation yeah, more sensitivity yeah. 
You know? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially in that realm of, um, you know, sex addiction, what, what I always say is that sex addiction isn't really even about sex. It yeah. really, it really is about kind of maladaptive coping escapism and also, you know, as so often with addiction, wanting attachment, right? Wanting that connection with other human beings. And I'm sort of having found this sort of artificial version of it. Um, but when we realize that that's really what's going on, you know, trying to get that deep attachment without using people. And again, the, the way that we can do that is primarily by awareness of our own tendencies to use people and then letting go of, of trying to control other people's perceptions or reactions and just kind of like being like, okay, you know, I am, I, this is, this is, it's going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's going to be all right. The sex is not even, sex addiction is not even about the sex component range true for me that it was so much more about just the constant um, need for the entertainment and excitement that came with hookups, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. pornography and all the other things included in my behaviors. Just that feeling of like anticipation that would, that, that would give the moment some pizzazz. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, that's a big part of recovery too, is like, what do you do with a life that has a lot less drama? Right. Yeah. It, there's a lot of drama in it, you know, in that addiction vortex. So kind of like readjusting to like, Oh gosh, okay. It's not going to be like me, you know, making up all these stories about where I was and what I did and then people finding out and then, you know, them getting mad and all that stuff. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Living a life that's more aimed at, um, living a life that's aimed at nourishment too, not, not getting caught in the pleasure trap to your own demise. Um, it's something I just really hope that we can encourage the listener to do with this conversation. Is there anything else that you might add to our tool belt for, um, recover for recovery and for venturing into the world, less r reliant on that pleasure button all the time to help help get our help get our own get our uh i don't know sea legs or land legs or get used to it yeah well i mean i just think there are so many messages in our culture today that tell us that we should be ecstatic 24 7 and if we're not there's something wrong with us or something wrong with our lives yeah. i think re really getting rid of that trope and and you know recognizing it's uh you know, it's the, the fundamental untruth in that, that, you know, life is hard and that, um, you know, most of us, most of the time are kind of struggling along here. Um, and that by trying to run from that fact or deny it or feel that we're alone or isolated in that experience just compounds our misery. But I think by sort of acknowledging, yeah, you know, this is hard, but I can find meaning and purpose, uh, you know, despite the fact that, being a human is super challenging. Yeah. There was a, uh, a quote by Viktor Frankl, the author of A Man's Search for Meeting. He's a Holocaust survivor. You're familiar with the book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he says, when a person can't find a deep sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasures. Yes, that's right. That's right. Very interesting stuff. Well, Anna, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me a little bit and talk about these things and share some of your insights with the listeners. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for your work and how it's touched my life and I know the lives of so many. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure.